Yeah, uh, time flies when you're having fun, I guess. So uh, we are at an end of our um, lecture course. Uh, so before I start, um, has everyone that uh, needs to do an exam got an email from me about the timings and the modality of the exam? If not, uh, do get in touch with either myself or Matteo or the course secretary. I've sent uh, an email and set up a spreadsheet uh, to sign up for particular times. Um, so just uh, let me know if there are any problems. Uh, what I haven't done yet, so the exam will be uh, on the 19th of April, so just over a month after the end of the lectures. And what I haven't done so far, but I will try to do as soon as possible, is to write a few exercises for you guys. And uh, um, uh, but in the meantime, you can look at the references and um, they, uh, particularly the book by David Mackay, uh, contains many exercises um, and solutions to the exercises. So it's a, it's a very good. Um, book to work from. Uh, anyway, the exam will only be, you know, a five minutes oral because I guess you're doing one of these for each of the mini courses. So put them together, they will make like a proper exam. And uh, I would just ask one or two short questions. So nothing to be concerned, too concerned about. So, um, uh, excuse me, professor. Yes, Carlo. Uh, regarding the short questions, if I may ask, uh, if I'm not pushing my luck, our luck too much, uh, will it be mostly a uh, derivation of theory uh, seen in the course or will it be uh, exercises? Yeah, no, it would be mostly on the theory. Okay. So, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know, I could ask things, I don't know, about you know, probability CPCA or linear regression, what does it mean to over, overfitting, you know, these kind of things, yeah. So all things that we've seen in the course and all uh, pretty much the theoretical material. Um, I mean, many of these, many exercises in, uh, in machine learning and in Bayesian inference, are, are, it's quite hard to give easy exercises that can be done with pen and paper, you know. So uh, the alternative would have been to do some sort of assignment, but you know, I, I think that might have been a bit too much. Um, anyway. Um, back to where we were, yes, yeah? so yesterday, a uh, brief recap, so are there any questions about yesterday's material? Uh, if so, do ask, uh, but the uh, bottom line is that uh, we saw recap from yesterday. We saw once again the, the major flaw of uh, the major flaw of basis function regression. which is uh, the zero variance. And we introduced as an abstract concept, a class of stochastic processes, which we call Gaussian processes. Which are uh, stochastic processes. And a stochastic process is a, a connection of random variables. Um, indexed by a certain index set. I guess most people are familiar with thinking of stochastic processes as temporal processes, but they don't have to be, just a collection of random variables indexed by a suitable index set. And in this case, it tends to be, it could be uh, R to the N, the index set, uh, but they have the property that every finite 
dimension marginal is Gaussian. And it's not just any Gaussian, but it's a Gaussian which is defined by the evaluation of a mean with, with parameters defined by the evaluation of a mean function over the set of points that define the finite dimensional marginal and the evaluation of a covariance function over the set of pairs of points in this set of in this finite set of points which define that finite dimensional margin. And we've seen that the, the really the crucial ingredient, I mean, the mean function, you, you know, it's just a deterministic mean. So you could subtract it from your process and you would get zero mean process. But the key ingredient is this covariance function. Yeah. And the main reference for this and also for today's material is the book by Rasmussen and Williams. Chapter two, uh, which contains everything that I would tell you and, and more. So we define these things, but how do we do computations with Gaussian processes? Yeah? And in particular, how do we do predictions, at least in a regression session, setting? Yeah? Well, it's the same old trick of doing computations with Gaussians. So we know now we are interested in a regression setup. So the scenario will be that we have pairs of input output points, yi and xi, where yi is a scalar and xi is potentially a vector, i equals one to n. And we postulate our regression model that yi is a function of xi plus a noise term. And this model we've seen many, many times, but this time. Excuse me. Yes, Matteo. Gaussian processes are supervised learning, right? Absolutely. And that's why we have input and output, output and input pairs. Okay. Yeah. So whenever you have, I mean, the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is um, when your data is defined in terms of pairs, inputs and outputs, that's supervised. If there isn't such a difference, it's unsupervised, basically. Having said that, you know, Gaussian processes for regression. So it's not that Gaussian processes is always supervised learning, just Gaussian processes are a probability distribution of the functions. Yeah? If we are using them in a regression setting as here, then we are using them for doing supervised learning. But there could be, and in fact, there are some situations where you use Gaussian processes in an unsupervised context. For example, the Gaussian process uh, latent variable model is, is a prominent example, uh, which I will not discuss though. So we now have that the, the function f is a draw from a Gaussian process. And as I've explained, you don't need to worry too much about the mean function. So I'll put a zero mean function, but with a certain covariance function k. And epsilon i are iid So what is the, um, the point of uh, doing a regression? Well, the point of doing a regression is generally to predict the value of your output at a new test input. So these would be our, our training set of inputs and outputs. And then we assume you have a test input. X star. And the question is predict Y star. Yeah. 
that's your task in a regression setup. And it could be that you have a batch of test inputs, well, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Uh, you will see uh, naturally how to do it for a batch as well. So how would we do that? Well, the characteristic of Gaussian processes is that they uh, have Gaussian finite dimensional marginals. So we're going to define a vector f, which is made up of the function values on the training data. And the function value on the test data. Yeah, for these ones, we have corresponding observations. And for these ones, we want to predict the observation. Now, what is going to be the joint distribution of these n plus one random variables? Well, very easy. These are all going to be distributed according to uh, uh, a Gaussian, that uh, would mean zero, and covariance k, where k is um, a matrix which we will write as this k, k star vector. So this is a column vector, this is a transpose, and then this would be k star star, where entry of kij is the function k on xi, xj. So the, the, the covariance function evaluated at pairs of training inputs, while k star i, so the ith entry of this vector is the covariance function evaluated on xi and x star. So on all the training points, see this is, a, this is an n by n matrix. This is a vector in r to the n, okay. We have n indices. And this k star star is the final piece of the puzzle, which is the covariance matrix evaluated at x star both times. Yeah? This is the joint prior distribution over the function values at the training point and the function values at the test point. This is the thing we're interested in predicting, having observed all of these data. So how, how are we going to do it? Well, you see, if we condition on the function values on the training points, then we get a distribution for f of x star, which is the thing that we're interested in. So for each value of the function vector evaluated, function value evaluated on the training points, we get a different distribution of the output on the test point. And now the question would be, okay, what specific value of fx1, fxn should I plug in? Well, one might simply think, okay, let's plug in the actual observations. That wouldn't be too bad a choice, to be honest. It would be a sensible thing to do. Uh, but of course, that would completely ignore the fact that the um, observations are noisy. What we need to do instead, if you followed the philosophy of this course, is to do Bayesian model average. So in the end, what we're interested in is a prediction. So we want to compute the distribution of f of x star given the data yi xi. Okay. 
How are we going to do that? Well, at the moment we have a joint distribution, f of x star, and then f of x1, f of xn. This is a joint distribution, but we can rewrite it as a conditional distribution times, you see, this is not, I've not finished writing yet. So we have, we want f of x star conditioned on the data. So the training input and output pairs. What we can rewrite it as is the f of x star condition on the functions on the training points, and we don't observe the functions, we observe y, which is a corrupt, noise corrupted version of the function. And then, however, we can use the data to learn something about the unobserved f of x1, f of xn. So we can construct a posterior. And of course, here, there is no trace of these variables here. So what we have to do is to integrate them out. Yeah. Bf x1. So this is Bayesian model averaging in practice. Yeah? If we want a prediction of the output of the new test input conditioned on what we have seen, and we've not seen the functional values, we've not seen the f's at xi, we've seen the y's, which are the f's plus noise, then what we need to do is to compute a posterior over those f's and then uh, use that posterior to average out the latent variables f's. And in this way, we obtain a distribution over the output given the data. What we need to do is, again, uh, the usual Bayesian calculations. So we need to compute this posterior. Yeah. This posterior is uh, obtained as a product of uh, a likelihood and uh, um, a prior suitably normalized. So this is going to be proportional to the probability of the observations given f of xi times the probability of, and this would be a product of an i because my observations have got iid noise, times the probability of x1, xn. Okay, this is still the same calculation that we've done a few times now, but every time in slightly different contexts. So what we have, we have iid observations, which means that the likelihood factorizes, so the probability of y1 y conditioned on x1 is independent of the probability of y2 conditioned on x2 and so on, and that's why we get um, this product here. And then we have a prior instead, which is correlated. Yeah? So the prior over the function values is correlated and is given uh, by the uh, Gaussian process prior, yeah? So these terms are all of the form exponential of minus a half, one over two sigma squared, yi minus f of xi squared, yeah? 
And this term here instead is exponential. Is exponential is uh, one over square root of two pi determinant of the K matrix. Exponential minus a half F vector transpose K to the minus one. Okay, this follows from the fact that we have a zero mean Gaussian process with covariance function k, and now this matrix k has as entry ij is k evaluated at xi. So we are given this prior, uh, the, the, we, we have to compute this posterior and the way we do it is exactly as we've done for all the regression problems that we've seen so far. We have uh, a likelihood term, which is factorized and actually all the regression problems that we will see in this course, likelihood term, which is factorized in a product of terms, each of them involving a scalar. And then we have a prior, which unlike the case of uh, linear regression, where the prior was an identity uh, covariance Gaussian on the weights, here it's a correlated prior. Okay. So once again, we need to compute the, uh, we need to compute the um, statistics of this posterior distribution, and it's going to be, uh, once again, it's going to be a Gaussian, and it will have its own covariance matrix, a covariance and mean uh, function. So, P of um, F, Good. Um, sorry, guys. You seem to be having some issue. Can, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. What can you see? I can see a black screen in front of me. Uh, uh, so we have a white screen with some uh, green uh, uh, rectangles. But probably you should uh, stop screen sharing and then uh, start. Yes, yes, do. Yeah. And um, so what were we talking about? So we had uh, shown that you know, the way you do um, prediction with Gaussian processes is through uh, Bayesian model averaging, which means you need first to compute a posterior distribution over your function values at the training points, because you don't observe the function values, you observe the function values plus noise. And so this function values vector, we call it F, conditioned on the observations, which are pairs of inputs and outputs. And uh, this is a product of a Gaussian likelihood times a multivariate Gaussian prior. So it is uh, a Gaussian itself. And what are its, uh, this is the calculation that we were doing, what are its uh, statistics, its mean vector and its covariance matrix? Well, we have to equate uh, the quadratic term in F in the in this definition so we have to do something that will be um, so it would be f transpose c minus one f and the quadratic terms in the um, product of likelihood times prior 
Uh, and these would have been uh, because we had n independent terms, we would have had n over sigma squared times, um, no, sorry, not n. Uh, one over sigma squared times f sum over i f of xi squared uh, plus this is the contribution from the prior okay and now this thing here is equal to f uh, to one over sigma squared f transposed times the identity matrix times F. So this tells us that uh, implies that C to the minus one is equal to uh, one of a sigma squared, the identity matrix plus K to the minus one. Yeah. And uh, if I take, I can take the minus one off from this side and add it on the other side. And then I can use um, the Woodbury formula. So there are a few um, identities that are uh, particularly useful in this type of um, of analysis uh, and one of them is, is the Woodbury formula which gives you uh, so this should be equal to k plus uh, sigma squared i okay which is basically telling me that the the a posteriori the variance is adding yeah? then the what about the mean now to compute the posterior mean i have to equate the linear terms And in the equation that I had in the standard Gaussian formulation, the linear terms are F transpose C minus one M and in the product of likelihood and prior. Now I don't have any linear terms in the prior because it's a zero mean prior, but I have linear terms in the um, likelihood and those linear terms are of the form uh, sum over i f of xi times yi divided by sigma squared. Yeah? And this I can view it as f transpose as one over sigma squared f transpose vector times the vector of the observations. And I, I see there are some issues in the chat and I'll finish the calculation and I will get back to you on that. And so I get the, the posterior mean is um, equal to uh, the um, matrix C times one over sigma squared and the vector of the observations and then using what I had derived before, I get um, C was this object here, I get K plus sigma squared two, one over sigma squared. Mr. the vector of the observations. Okay, so we had some questions in the chat. Uh, uh, oh, what is it? Is the Woodbury formula? 
also known as Sherman Morrison. Well, Woodbury identity or Sherman Morrison formula, or it's, it goes under several. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you the link. Uh, um, so this is the, the link on the Wikipedia page. And it's, it's, a, it's a, so in this case, it's a particularly simple uh, situation where you have um, A is equal to uh, C uh, to uh, K and C is equal to um, one over sigma squared times the identity and U and V are um, identity matrices. Okay. So let's get back. So what we need to do now, we need to uh, compute uh, the, um, we need to compute the predictive distribution. Yeah? And the predictive distribution P of Y, uh, not Y, F, or f of x star condition on the data is um, obtained as uh, an integral over the d f variables when f is the function values, unobserved function values at the training inputs of the conditional of f of x star given f of the training inputs times the posterior over the training inputs given these observations, yeah? Now, this is a, a somewhat unpleasant calculation because it needs, you need to compute this um, conditional, yeah? And computing conditionals, as I think, you know, we discussed in one of your lessons, uh, when you have your system defined from equations, it's trivial to compute conditionals. So, you know, if I have my equation y equals f of x plus uh, epsilon, then it's trivial to compute probability of y conditional f. But when you have your system defined in matrix format, then you need to, um, and what you need to do, you need to take the joint of these things, which has a joint covariance uh, which we had written and compute the so-called um, and, and compute the, the, the conditional, which means fixing the F and computing what is the resulting Gaussian here. Yeah. So I'm not going to do this calculation uh, but I'll um, write out the result, which you can find. You can find the derivation in the book uh, of uh, Rasmussen and Williams. And uh, it's on page, uh, let me see, it's on page 16. And then we will comment the results together. Yeah? So this is again a Gaussian. It's a one-dimensional Gaussian, so it's got a variance and um, a mean. It's not a covariance, it's an invariance. Now the mean 
so expectation under the posterior under the predictive of of f of x star is obtained as um, is obtained as a linear combination of the input data and is given uh, by a very nice formula, well, relatively nice formula. Um, so you have to take the, um, the K star vector, you multiply uh, K star transpose, Times the y back. Okay. So this is um, the vector, if you remember, uh, it, it was in the previous uh, failed Zoom meeting. K star is the covariance function evaluated at xi. So index i, xi, and x star. So you take the covariance function evaluated at all the input points that gives you end at the test point, all the training points and the test point that gives you a vector. You multiply it times this matrix, which is the uh, posterior, the inverse of the posterior covariance, and then you multiply. So this is um, n by one. And so transpose is one by n, this is n by n. This is n by one. Okay, so this is the mean value. It's interesting to observe two things. So it's it's a linear combination of the inputs. So the the posterior mean, the predictive mean, is a, always a linear. Of the in, of the uh, of the training outputs, not inputs, sorry. But also, it's a linear combination of terms of the form k x star x i okay and so if you think of it as um each of these ones is like a basis function yeah it's a function x i is fixed so i mean this contains the x i and the x j so this is just a matrix of fixed numbers x star is the thing that is a variable we're trying to predict the function of f at x star which is our independent variable so it's as if we are doing a linear combination of basis functions, but the number of basis functions that we're using is the same as the number of training points. Okay. And that is completely different from the setup of basis function regression, where you fix the number of basis functions and then you do your regression. Well, here, So here, the number of basis functions, if you wish to call them like that, is equal to the number of data points. Training data points. And so sometimes people call this some sort of, uh, you know, adaptive complexity of the model. Yeah? So the more data points you have, the more the richer the class of functions that you can use. Oh. 
for your predictions. Yeah. So the, the more training points you have, the more basis functions you're going to use, the more complicated your predictive function is going to be. Okay, is this clear? So the, the kind of, you know, the calculations are a bit, uh, you know, sometimes boring and sometimes not totally trivial as well. Uh, but the, the line of reasoning should be clear. You know, we have this process where the finite dimensional marginals are multivariate Gaussians with correlations. So given some training data, we can compute the posterior on the function, so some noisy observations of the function, we compute the posterior of the function, and then the correlations induced by the Gaussian process through the covariance function enable us to obtain a predictive distribution over the function value at the new input, which is going to be Gaussian and has a very specific form. And here we're exploring the form. We obtain it through model averaging, Gaussian, uh, Bayesian model averaging. And the, the form is, is quite interesting because you, as you see, the, the predictive function is a linear combination of the outputs that you've observed, your training outputs, but it's also a linear combination of a number of basis functions and the number of basis functions which determines the complexity of the functions that you can observe increases the more training data points you have. Okay. Some people even call this kind of automatic Occam razor because it kind of controls the complexity based on the amount, amount of data that you have. Is this clear? Do you want to ask questions on the posterior mean? So if there are no questions, let's move on to the posterior covariance now. So obviously the, the predictive distribution is a Gaussian, so it's got its own mean and its own variance. And we are looking at predicting at a single point. So it's one dimensional uh, random variable. So we now want the, the, the variance. So we call it C star, which is the same thing as the variance of f of x star and how do we obtain it we do Bayesian model averaging so we do a whole lot of Gaussian computations and that's uh, you know a bit tedious but it's in the book if you want to look at it now the, the final result is this. Yeah. So remember what these terms are. Yeah. So remember that I've defined, uh, I've broken up my, um, so this is, uh, let's say this is um, big sigma, let's say, where um, um, P of F, F of X star. is normal new big sigma. Okay, so the joint distribution of f of f star has got this block structure, block the joint prior distribution, which contains uh, k, which is the covariance matrix evaluated at pairs of input points or a pairs of training input points. Then K star is the vector obtained by evaluating the covariance function on the training input and the test input. And then K star star is K 
on x is the prior value. So it's k on x star and x star. So two important, well, a number of important observations here. So there, nowhere here there is the data, yeah, the observed output. So the posterior variance does not depend in any way on the observed values. Now, this might seem a little bit strange because, you know, suppose I had observed uh, function values like this. And I try to predict here, then you probably would be reasonably confident that it's somewhere here, the function. Yeah, I would have some function for this part. But if instead I had observed and then one point here, massive outlier for whatever reason. And I tried to predict in the same point. Well, instead of saying, well, it could be anywhere between here and here, no, it would give me exactly the same posterior variance. Yeah, it's exactly the same predictive variance. It would say it's probably around here, but it would have exactly the same predictive variance as here. So this is a little bit weird. And the other thing that is kind of weird. Yeah. So this term is the prior variance. If I take the Gaussian process and take its one dimensional marginal, which is the value of the function f at x star, okay, one dimensional variance, what would it be? Well, it would be the covariance function evaluated at that point and at that point. So two inputs, which are the same. So that's a prior variance. So observations will always, the, the, the predictive variance, the posterior or predictive variance, let's say posterior predictive, the posterior predictive variance is always smaller than the prior. So observing more data always makes you more confident of the value of the function. So which once again, it kind of makes sense in the let's say business as usual scenario, but uh, you know, in a scenario like this, where you have an outlier, it doesn't really make sense. You know, if I had observed all of these points, let's say, then I'd be re relatively confident that I have a function like this. And at this position here, I would predict somewhere here with a certain variance. Now, if just before here, I observe another point all the way up here, then my Gaussian process would have to work extremely hard to try to fit that. But the, the posterior mean here would be shifted up, but its actual uncertainty would have been shrunk, which is really strange. It really shouldn't happen that way. So, you know, there are some very nice things about Gaussian processes. Yeah? So just to, to wrap up this kind of very rapid introduction that we've done. Yeah? And it's not a surprise that they are amongst the most widely used techniques in machine learning. So this is um,
so G, P, pros and cons. So certainly a massive pro is, um, I don't know that, sorry, I forgot to say one thing before we move on. The other thing that is important to notice yeah, on these posterior variants, predictive variants, is what happens if I'm trying to predict at a very far point. Yeah? So as you will see, this term, if you have a stationary Gaussian process, will not, you know, it will be the same. The prior will be the same everywhere, whether you're trying to predict near the data or whether you're predicting very far from the data. But this reduction term depends on this K star uh, kernel function, uh, basis functions. Yeah, and these K star uh, basis functions are of the form K of Xi, where I is a training input X star. So if Xi, if the training data is very far from the point where I'm trying to predict, say I'm trying to predict uh, right here and all my training data is here, then these terms will be very close to zero. And obviously this does not depend on where I'm testing. So the, the third thing is that um, far from the data, from the training data, Uh, the variance is constant and greater than zero. Yeah? So it returns to the prior variance, which is a good thing. So these two things are a bit bad, but this is a very good thing. You know, we have a model that when it's far from the data, it will return the honest answer of saying, well, you know, this data is so far that it doesn't really tell me much about this function. I tell you what the prior is, which is great. It's also what basis function regression was saying, except that basis function regression was set up to be infinitely confident far from the training data. So GP pros and cons, you know, they're they are flexible and they have this adaptive complexity. which is a great feature. And the more data you have, the more complicated functions you are allowed to express. Uh, the other big pro is that they are somewhat, you know, honest with the data. Yeah, so far from training, they return to uh, the prior. So these are pros. The big con is what uh, I've described before, uh, which is um, they are somewhat vulnerable to outliers. because uh, the posterior variance always decrease. And the, the final problem, which is something that has exercised machine learning researchers for a lot of time, is that, as you see here, you need to invert an N by N matrix in order to obtain the posterior variance, or you need to uh, solve a linear system. Uh, we don't necessarily need to invert the, the, the matrix, we need to solve an n by n linear system to get the posterior mean. And so a, a major drawback is that um, they scale as or big O of n cubed, where n is the number of training points. And therefore, you can't really do very large data sets. But however, 
uh, there exists some partial solutions to this. Okay, so I hope that this has given you some idea of some of the potentially interesting things that can be done with Bayesian inference. We've actually really looked at the linear case, the linear Gaussian case, which is the only setup where you can do calculations explicitly. So you can write out analytically, you know, I could write out, I, I need to, um, you know, if I specify what K is, for example, the radial, radial, radial basis function covariance function, then I can write analytically what's the function the predictive mean and variance everywhere in the input space. I can do the calculations, which is great. On the other hand, of course, they are um, only a very small subset of what machine learning is about, particularly these days, but they're still quite a useful subset because they're tractable and they give you a good insight about how the methods work. And uh, I hope this will be of use to you in the rest of your career. I appreciate this maybe slightly tangential to some other complex systems things that you'll be seeing, but um, you know, being able to model some data will presumably come handy at some stage in your lives. So thank you very much for uh, staying with me for all this time and uh, thank Matteo for inviting me. And I guess I'll see at least some of you at the at the exam. Yes, so are there final questions or? Uh, okay, so I think we can stop here. Thank you very much, Guido, for this uh, very good, uh, very interesting course. And uh, so see you all uh, tomorrow. Yeah, and do get in touch with me if you have questions or anything. So, you know, my, my email is easily obtainable. Thank you.